let's open up our Bibles uh, once again to the book of uh, 1 Samuel. And uh, tonight we're going to be taking a look at chapter 7. Now, the Lord's uh, ancient people, like uh, a lot of people today and like a lot of people throughout history, have a tendency to sort of make God in their image. That if there's something difficult for us, then we just assume that it's difficult for God. If something easy for us, then we think, okay, then it must be easy for God. If if there's something that we like, well, then we just instinctively believe, well, God likes that. And if there's something that we dislike, then we just think, well, God dislikes that. And so we tend to see God through the lens of uh, ourselves. Now, Charles Spurgeon, he said it this way. He said, man fashions for himself a God after his own liking. He makes to himself, if not of wood or stone, yet out of what he calls his own consciousness or his cultured thought, a deity to his taste, who will not be too severe with his iniquities or deal out strict justice to the unrepentant. He rejects God as he is and elaborates other gods such as he thinks the divine one ought to be. And so we like to think of God in terms of we we dumb God down. We think of God in terms of the man upstairs. We see God as being somewhat of a grandfatherly figure that's going to give us, you know, what whatever it is that we're uh, begging him for. And we we so oftentimes do not relate to God as he is revealed in the scripture, as he is revealed in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 57. For thus says the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so our God is a God who inhabits eternity. Our God is this high and this lofty one. Our God is not a big man, right? Our God is not some advanced human being, but he is high and he is holy. And who does he dwell with? Who does he fellowship with but those who are humble, those who walk before him with brokenness and contriteness? Uh, Again, who does God resist? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so as we walk humbly before our God, recognizing that he is far above us, he is this high and lofty one, we have fellowship with our God. We are honoring him and we are seeing him and relating to him uh, as he is. Now, as we get to chapter 7, the nation of Israel, they are in a complete and uh, utter mess, and they are living contrary to who God is. The priesthood is polluted. The Ark of the Covenant is out in somebody's barn. You've got the culture that's just head over heels with the worship of all kinds of false gods. They have, they have put ritual over relationship, ritual over reality. It's such a tendency for us that we think that if we do the religious thing, that that's, a, that's what God is really interested in. Uh, do you know that Jesse and Frank James. Now these guys, they robbed like 20 banks, who knows how many trains. They killed like 17 guys. Uh, But they they sang in the choir, and they taught Sunday school, right? And no doubt, the whole time thinking, they were square with God. Because what we put the importance on is the religious activity. God does not care how great we sing in the sanctuary. He's interested in how we walk in the world, how we're walking in the street Monday through Saturday. Who cares what you do for an hour of your life uh, on a Sunday, if you will. And so here is the nation of Israel. They've gone through all the religious formalities, but they have not honored God. And so now they have drifted far from God. They They have experienced incredible defeat. 
But now God is going to revive. God is going to bring them back to himself. And what we have in chapter 7 is perhaps the greatest awakening, the greatest revival that ever happened among the nation of Israel. Now again, we hear a lot of talk today about revival. We'll see a lot of Facebook posts about what people are telling us that, you know, revival's breaking out here and revival's breaking out there. I like what Dr. Raven, uh, uh, Dr. Leonard Ravenhill said. He said, revival is when God uh, gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented uh, that he shows up himself. And so what does it look like when God shows up among his people? What, is, what does it look like when there is awakening within society, when society has realized how they have offended uh, the Holy One of, of Israel? Now, again, we, we have many people that are promoting this idea that prolonged worship service is revival, Prolonged uh, prayer service is revival. Uh, people dancing a jig and waving a flag in, in worship. And, and we're being told that what we're watching, this, this video is portraying uh, revival. Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was a man who was a part of you know, great awakenings in his day, he tells us this is what uh, revival looks like. It is an operation that exalts Jesus it attacks Satan's interest, it exalts the Holy Scriptures, it lifts up sound doctrine, and it promotes love to God and man. Now, there, there are all kinds of words that we use to describe this. We, we have the word renewal, and, and renewal is describing when there is that personal uh, return uh, to your relationship with the Lord. You've, you've lived for a period of time away from God. You've made foolish choices. You've brought harm to yourself, harm to your uh, family, and, and there's an awakening that takes place in your soul. I've got to return back to the Lord. I want to start doing life the way God wants me to do life. Um, when, when I was a young believer, it, it was a kind of a thing within churches at that time that they would have rededication services and and of course at that time you know you, you didn't have you know, you, you know you didn't have uh, websites you had you had the newspaper and so you'd look at the religious section of the newspaper and all right you know first whatever church they've got a rededication service this Friday night and so you you would attend and the whole idea was is that you as an individual, you've got to return. You've got to take seriously the call that God's placed upon your life. I had, I had lunch today with an old friend of mine, and uh, I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have lunch with so-and-so today. And uh, my wife says, you tell him that he is the biggest un, uh, un, uh, unachiever, underachiever uh, in the kingdom of God. And... Uh, I mean, this guy has just got potential all over. If, if this guy wants, and I'm convinced it's going to happen, that once this guy starts walking with the Lord, uh, he, he could be a guy that would reach our entire community. He's just, he's got this big personality. And I just, I just know what God can do in, in this guy's life. And, and I looked at him and, and I said, you are the biggest underachiever in the kingdom of God. And his eyes got watery. And he said, I, I know, I know. And uh, pray for me, uh, pray for me. There's, there, there has to be a renewal that takes place in our life. And then, and then revival, this is, this is when you have a, a, a faith community. You have an entire church. Maybe you've gone through a long season where there's deadness, where there's been defeats, and the congregation has been talking to each other and saying, you know, we, we as a church, we got to get it back on track again. There was a time when our church loved God and was used of God. And so when you see these large groups of people coming together, we speak of that as a revival. And then, of course, there is an awakening. An awakening is when the church begins to walk as the salt and the light and because the church is being what God wants it to be, it spills over into the 
larger society to where we're not talking about, well, we've got to change regulations on strip clubs. You know, we don't want strip clubs here. We want them in this part of our city. But it's where strip clubs are actually beginning to close because men's hearts are being changed. Men are being converted. That, that, that society is changing because the church is the church and the gospel is being proclaimed and there are large numbers of men and women's souls who are being won uh, into the kingdom uh, of God. You know, Ben Franklin, he was a part of Whitfield's uh, great awakening that was taking place all up and down the eastern seaboard uh, of this country. And in Benjamin Franklin's, in his biography, he said, it seems that all the world is growing religious I can't even walk down a street in the city of Boston without hearing families singing psalms in worship to God in their houses. Now that's when you'll know you got a revival. When you have got politicians that are saying everywhere we go, these people are worshiping God. Not when you see videos on social media. And this is what we are praying for, for our own nation. That God, by his grace and mercy, that he would awaken our nation. But he's not going to be able to awaken the nation until he awakens uh, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that happen? Well, this now is what we read here in chapter 7. So in verse 1, we read, now, now remember, the, the ark was in uh, Philistine uh, territory. Philistines had a very bad experience with that ark, didn't they? And so they got rid of it, and they sent it to Beshemish. Beshemish was a Levitical city. It was given to the Levites. They should have known better. They disrespected the ark of the covenant, and very bad things happened to them. And so now they uh, say... Uh, to Curry, Curry Jeff, uh, Jerem, uh, hey, you guys come and get the ark. And so this now, in verse 1, the men of Kurjath, uh, Jerem, they came and they took the ark of the Lord. And they brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated Eliezer, his son, uh, to keep the ark uh, of the Lord. Now, I'm thinking... They probably didn't need to worry about the ark. It appears, doesn't it, from our last chapter, the ark is uh, well able to take care of itself. But they got one of the boys. I don't know if he's dusting it off. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, but he takes care uh, of, of the ark. And, uh, and so it was that the ark remained in kerjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented uh, after the Lord. Now, the ark is only about eight miles from Jerusalem. Now, remember, it left Shiloh, never returns to Shiloh. Shiloh was probably destroyed. After the Philistines took the ark, they probably made the journey to Shiloh and just finished wiping out the whole place. And so it's never going to return there. Eventually, when David is king, David is going to make sure uh, that the ark ends up in the city of Jerusalem. Of course, eventually the temple is going to be built there, and the ark will uh, remain there permanently. Uh, now, there are some who see uh, that the Bible is contradicting itself, because here we're being told that the ark was there for 20 years. Now, the ark doesn't go to Jerusalem until David is in control of Jerusalem. Now, when David becomes king, he does not have control of Jerusalem. David does not have control of all of Israel until seven years into his reign uh, as king. So we've got this long reign of Samuel. Then we're going to have 40 years with, with Saul. And then we're going to be well in to the reign of David before the ark is going to get moved. Now here you read this and says, well, it was there for 20 years. Well, no, no, it, it had to be there for at least 60 years, maybe longer than that. And so there are people who say, aha, the Bible, the Bible is contradicting itself. Now you read what it says here. It says it was there for 20 years. What it's saying, it doesn't, it doesn't then say, well, then they moved it somewhere else. It says it was there for 20 years. And then Israel lamented. 
Then Israel began to cry out to the Lord. It's telling us that there's 20 years in between verse 2 and verse 3. I like Holman Christian Standard Bible, the way it says it. Time went by until 20 years had passed since the ark had been taken to Kirjath, uh, Jerem. And then the whole house of Israel began to seek the Lord. It was there for 20 years. They had, they had not uh, celebrated uh, the Day of Atonement, any of the feast days, they hadn't had work. Now, what did that have to be like for the people of God? Imagine for a church, you don't have a worship service for like 20 years, right? You're going to quickly figure out, well, something's wrong here. Something's not quite right. And so slowly but surely, conviction is now coming upon all of Israel. Every tribe now is being convicted. We have got to get our act uh, back together again. So notice in verse 3 that then Samuel, he spoke to all of the house of Israel, saying, if, that's a big if, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods, the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord. Serve him only and he will deliver you uh, from the hand of the Philistines. Now, again, Samuel, he's not a little kid anymore. Now, last time we left Samuel, he was a little kid. Now, remember what's, what's taken place. Eli is dead, right? And, and when Eli was killed, the, the priest was killed, the ark ended up in Philistine hands, and how long was it there? It was there for seven months. Now, how long was it at Beth Shemesh, and, and how, how long was it until they, they moved it to this city? There's really no way of us telling. And now 20 years have gone by, right? So, so we've got at least probably 21 years since, since Samuel was a, a little kid. So this is... 30-something Samuel now, all right? This is millennial Samuel uh, that, that we have here. And so millennial uh, Samuel, he, he says, uh, this young man uh, says to them, now look, God wants to renew. God wants to uh, revive. God wants to waken. But what has to happen in order for this to take place? Notice the very first thing that he says now, uh, you return to the Lord uh, with all of your heart. Now notice the very first thing is not an action, right? This isn't an action step. This isn't a physical step. This is an emotional step. He is saying to them, you have got to become passionate about your creator. You have to become passionate about your relationship uh, with your God. This is very, very similar to what we have in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, the very first church, the church at Ephesus. What does the Lord say? Hey, you guys have left. You've, you've left your first love. You've turned your back and you have walked away. You've got to return uh, to your uh, first love. Oftentimes, uh, you'll say to a couple that's going through uh, marital problems, you'll, you'll say to them, all right, now, when you fell in love, what were you doing? When you were first in love and you were just, you know, knocked off of your feet by this person, what were you doing? What were your, the activities in your life? You've got to go back to that. Go back to what caused you to fall in love with them uh, in the first place. And, and so he says to them, now, return to God with all of your heart. When was the last time you called to mind that that morning, that afternoon, that night when you first gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you remember the euphoria? Do you remember the excitement? Do you remember the emotions of the heart and mind that went through you when you considered my sins are forgiven, I'm not going to go to hell, God has saved me. Oh Lord, thank you so much for your rich love and your mercy. And you remember you were just kind of walking on cloud nine. How long has it been since you've gone back to that night, that morning in your mind and recalled how good God had been to you and where you were and what your response was? And so this is what Samuel is saying. You want to awaken, 
revival in your heart. You got to go back and fall in love with the Lord all over again. Notice the second thing that he says now. So it's not all emotion, is it? There's emotion there. But there's also action. You need to put away these foreign gods. What, what do you got going on in your life? that is robbing God of his rightful position in your life? What kind of little side hustle do you have going on that maybe nobody knows about that is a hindrance that's keeping God from being God in your life? Where are you not allowing him to be Lord of your life? What has to be ruthlessly thrown down in order that Christ and Christ alone would rule from the throne of your heart. Get rid of that stuff. Then notice he says, prepare your hearts. Now that word prepare is an interesting word. It's the very same word that was used in Joshua chapter three when we read that the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, they stood firm. That's our word here, prepare. They stood firm. We're standing our ground. It's used again in Psalm 108. Oh God, my heart is fixed. That's our word here. In other words, we're not being wishy-washy about this. I am gonna live for God. I'm gonna make a stand for God. I'm sick of living a defeated life. I'm sick of compromise robbing me from what God wants me to experience in this life. I am not going to give one inch to the enemy of my soul. And you've got to determine that in your heart. Prepare your heart, fix your heart. I am gonna sidle up to God and I am not going anywhere. And then notice he says, now serve him only I'm getting rid of all of this stuff and he is going to have that primary place in my life i'm going to begin to make his concerns my concerns i'm going to get involved in a soup kitchen i'm going to get involved with samaritan's purse i'm going to get involved supporting some mission i'm going to get involved with the kingdom of god and i'm going to become a part i'm going to i'm going to start shouldering some of the load for the kingdom of god and i am going to make his interest my interest reuben tory he said look you want revival there are three things that are needed he said number one you get a few christians who get together thoroughly serious uh, with god themselves you get a you get a couple of your friends together and you commit yourself you're a band of brothers a band of sisters and you know what Let's begin to keep each other accountable here. I'm going to challenge you. I give you permission to challenge me. And by golly, we're not going to allow any of us to fall into defeat. And then he said, number two, you bind themselves. You get them to bind themselves together in a prayer group and you pray. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're going to gather together and we're going to pray. And thirdly, they put themselves at the disposal of God uh, for him uh, to use as he sees fit. God, here I am. I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want to do. But Lord, we're gathering together. We're loving each other. We're challenging each other. We're praying. And now, Lord, you open up whatever door it is that you want me to walk through. And you get a handful of believers that start living like that and you're gonna to begin to impact the wider society uh, around your church. Now, notice in verse four, the children of Israel, they put away the Baals and the Ashereth. Now, Baal, that's the god of money. Ashereth is the god of sex, money and sex. These are the two great powers uh, that rule over the human heart. And you get a group of people that will submit their greed and submit their lust to God, something very grand is about to happen. And so here's, here's an entire group of people, the nation of Israel, and they're saying, God, we're gonna look to you to bless our lives, we're gonna trust that you're gonna prosper us, and we're gonna submit our sexuality uh, un, unto you. And, uh, and so he says, now you, you, you give, give these things up, and they serve the Lord only. And Samuel says, Samuel said, gather all of Israel to Mizpah. Now, we have, we have no idea why, why Mizpah, but that's where they went. And uh, I will pray uh, to the Lord for you. And so they gathered together at Mizpah. Now, they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned 
against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel uh, at uh, Mizpah. Now, this, this uh, appears to have all of the signs of genuine uh, renewal taking place here. Notice, please, the straightforward manner uh, of their confession. Right? No, notice uh, that, that they are willing to own. There's, there's no excuses being given here. They don't say, well, we sin, but you know, those rotten Philistines, you know, they just caught us at the right time. Or, you know, God, he should have told us uh, not to take the ark uh, from Shiloh in the first. Yeah, we sin, but God this and the Philistines that. Look, what the Lord is looking for is simple brokenness. And broken, you know when a person is broken because their mouth is shut. As long as a person is talking, they are not broken. We've got the example of the Pharisee, the tax collector. They go up before God to pray. What does the tax collector do? Beats on his chest. This is the problem, my own stinking heart. Have mercy on me, oh God. Then he shut his mouth. That's brokenness. What was the Pharisee do? He just run in his mouth. I'm glad I'm this way and I'm glad I'm that way, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus said that that tax collector walked away from prayer justified before God. He was a broken man. Again, who does God give grace to? He gives grace to the humble. Who does God resist? He resists the proud. And as long as you're blaming your spouse, blaming your parents, Blame in your church for what's gone wrong in your life. You're not a broken person, and God is resisting you. Do you want help? Do you want victory? Do you want to be an overcomer? Then you come humbly before God, broken, just as I am without one plea. Here I come. I have sinned. Have mercy upon me, O oh God and the Lord uh, blesses. And that is, of course, what certainly uh, happens here. Now, notice uh, they pour out water. Now, why do they pour out water? It was very symbolic. You, you pour out water on arid, dry ground, and uh, you're not going to get the water back, right? You dump it out, you're not going to get that water back, right? And what they're doing, they're coming before God, and they're saying, look, we're not... We're not getting anything back here, right? We're not, we're not going to take anything back. We're pouring ourselves out. We're all dumped out, so to speak, before you. We are totally and completely committed to doing what it is you're wanting to do uh, in our nation. So they end up here in uh, Mizpah, slightly north. And as, as I say, I'm not, I'm not quite sure why they went up there, but the Philistines, they've got some military reconnaissance going on. They see a large gathering taking place uh, near Shiloh, and they think the worst. They don't like this at all. They smell a rat, and so they think... Uh, Israel's up to something, and so they mobilize their military, and now they're getting ready to strike Israel. Um, but it's going to be okay because Israel is now right with God. And if you're walking in a right relationship with God, let men make their plans. Let your enemies scheme all they want. Let people lie about you. You're walking with God. You're in a right relationship with God, and God not only knows how to protect himself, he knows how to protect you. And so there's no reason for us to be dominated by fear or anxiety. You get your life right with the Lord. You walk with him, and you have to fear nothing. And so we read in verse 7 that the Philistines, they heard that the children of Israel, they'd gathered together at Mizpah, and the lords of the Philistines, they went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel, when they heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. That's you know, they had a good reason to. And so the children of Israel said unto Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord, our God, for us, that he may save us. Oh, this different, something's different here, isn't it? That he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. See, the last time this happened, what were they doing? They were running to their religious relic. 
They're running to the ark. Bring the ark, right? Bring the candles. Bring the beads, right? We uh, bring all of the religious paraphernalia that you can so that we can have victory. But notice now, they're not going back to that. They're going to the Lord. Hey, Samuel, pray to the Lord for us. It's the Lord that's going to save us. It's not the religious paraphernalia that's, that's going to save us. And notice then in verse 12, and Samuel he, t- he took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. And so the Philistines, they were subdued, right? And, uh, and they, they did not come anymore into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord uh, was against the Philistines Um, all the days uh, of Samuel. So God, uh, earlier there in verse 10 and 11, he thundered uh, against them. There's this miraculous victory that comes. And so after the victory, now uh, Samuel uh, takes this stone and they set it up as a a memorial. And this is always good, I think, for us to do as the followers of Christ. God has given you victory, right? There have been times in your life where you've had special occasions of victory where you knew that God stepped into your situation and brought about a wonderful blessing in your life. I think it's important that we remember those times, that we not quickly forget. I mean, if, if you did a great favor for somebody else, you might be a little offended if they forgot some wonderful thing that you did for them. Well, here's the Lord doing one wonderful thing for us after another, and how prone are we to forget? what the Lord has done. And so Samuel, he doesn't want this occasion forgotten. So he takes a big old stone and he says, we're going to call this stone Ebenezer, right? Now, we, we sang you know, one, of, one of my favorite hymns. It says, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart, sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And that song got that from this passage, right? That he's raising this Ebenezer stone, this stone of remembrance. I'm remembering what the Lord has done done. Uh, Joni Erickson, uh, or, or Spurgeon, really, I shouldn't get those two confused, should I? Uh, through poverty and through wealth, through sickness, through health, at home, abroad, on land, on sea, in perplexity, in joy, in trial, in triumph, in prayer, in temptation, thus far God has helped us. Oh, how faithful our God has been. Now, uh, Johnny uh, Erickson said, my wheelchair is my Ebenezer. I've raised it up as a memorial to commemorate God's grace in my life. And of course, God is so worthy. So where, where is that Ebenezer stone in your life? Where have you set up that memorial that you would be reminded of God's great goodness? Well, we close with verse 15. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life and he went from year to year in a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah and he judged Israel in all those places but he always returned to Ramah. Now, that's where his mom and dad were from, right? That's his childhood home and uh, for his home was there and uh, there he judged Israel and there he built uh, the altar uh, on to the Lord. And so he has this circuit, primarily in the territory of the tribe of, of Benjamin, uh, right there on the, on the boundary of, of Judah. And so he was this kind of a circuit preacher, if you would, that, that he would go from town to town, and when there would be disputes, when there would be disagreements, when there would be 
communities that's starting to get off base, maybe stepping back from their commitment to the Lord. Here is this great man that would step in and uh, he would encourage and he would judge and he would say, hey, uh, guys, this is how you, you need to be living your life. So Samuel, his, his ministry was just a, uh, a great ministry. And, and again, this is all an example that if we will just properly prioritize our lives if we will make him our God uh, that he blesses our lives and so here's Israel they're coming back to the Lord they're remembering the Lord oh God we've sinned please forgive us God we're making a commitment we're going to do life your way and and now here comes the enemy and what does the Lord do the Lord takes care of the enemy So I think as we go to prayer tonight, we need to be praying uh, that we would be returning to our first love. Are there commitments that you've made to God in the past that you have long forgotten? Are there there things that are uh, removing your passion from the Lord? Uh, What does returning to your first love mean? look like well we need to pray that God will be giving us his grace that such a thing could happen now father we ask now that as we leave this place would you would you help our uh, church um, to be the salt to be the light you've called us to be Father, would you continue to squeeze our hearts and draw us into these small groups with one another that we would have um, a genuine Uh, fellowship in the body of Christ, that we would have uh, a genuine fellowship with each other where we're challenging one another, we're questioning one another, we're encouraging one another, and we're praying for one another. Lord, I, I ask that wherever there is deadness in this congregation, whatever we are overlooking, whatever, whatever area of spiritual death Uh, is taking place in our congregation, Father, would you, by your grace and by your spirit, would you challenge that? Make us aware of it. Give us the grace to repent and and to turn from it, Lord. We pray that this congregation would be a congregation that just honors you, glorifies you, and certainly remembers all of the good things that you have done for us. Lord, Lord, Cause this entire church to be an Ebenezer stone, Father. You have been so faithful indeed. Now, Lord, help us as we leave this place to properly prioritize our lives and help us to walk in the victory of Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.